We last looked at Netherlandish art in the mid-1560s with the career of Peter Bruchel, whose uh, artistic career ended right at the start of the Eighty Years' War. By 1585, the Spanish firmly held most of the southern Netherlands, which thus remained Catholic and loyal to the Spanish crown. Antwerp would maintain its position as the most important artistic center of this region. The greatest Antwerp painter of the 17th century was also the most important painter in Europe of his generation, Sir Peter Paul Rubens. We tend to anglicize his name. Uh, Rubens, whose dates were 1577 to 1640, was one of the most important figures in Counter-Reformation art, and his paintings left Antwerp to go all over Europe. Uh, he also loyally served his rulers, the Spanish regents of the Netherlands, as both a painter and a diplomat. A true intellectual as well, Rubens maintained correspondence with scholars all over Europe about a number of subjects and designed his own Italianate-style house and workshop in Antwerp. Rubens's choice of profession had been unusual since his father had been a civil servant uh, and his family was well-to-do. But this social background would prove of benefit in his career, in which he dealt with many court figures in Europe. His teacher, Otto von Vein, was a learned figure, and surely he encouraged Rubens to go to Italy for further study. Rubens remained in Italy from 1600 to 1608, where he worked for the Duke of Mantua. This gave him the opportunity to study the art of classical antiquity, of the Renaissance, and of the most recent masters, including Caracci and Caravaggio. In late 1608, Rubens returned to Antwerp, where he formed a large workshop to fulfill these international commissions for patrons such as Marie de Medici, Philip IV of Spain, and Charles I of England. We can see all phases of Rubens' career in the 24 paintings by him owned by the National Gallery. It is appropriate, given Rubens' service to the Spanish crown, that his paintings are displayed in a room that flanks those from 17th century Spain. Now, Rubens' Samson and Delilah from about 1609 or 10 is a fine example of his ability to synthesize ideas from other artists but develop them in his own impressive way. This painting was made for one of the most important figures in Antwerp, in Rubens' life and also as ruling Antwerp, Nicholas Rocox, who was a merchant and nine times burgomaster or mayor of the city. It hung over a fireplace in, the, in his grand house in the salon or reception room. We've seen an earlier depiction of the subject by Andrea Montaigne. Here the subject is depicted as an indoor night scene. Samson slumbers on Delilah's lap, worn out by their activities, while one of the Philistines already cut Samson's hair. His companions, the other soldiers, wait at the door holding a candle so they'll know when to burst in on the scene. Delilah is aided by an old woman who holds a candle. Most 17th century viewers would likely see her as a procuress, something like a female pimp, since Delilah was often understood to be a prostitute. What has brought Samson down then? Love, as indicated by the sculpture of Venus and Cupid that stands in a niche behind the figures. Their dramatic chiaroscuro and powerful naturalism recalls the art of Caravaggio, and we know that Rubens copied some of the paintings of Caravaggio when in Rome. Yet, compared to Caravaggio, both Samson and Delilah are somewhat idealized as types, and the muscular figure of Samson also owes something to Michelangelo in the Sistine ceiling. At the same time, Rubens has by no means forgotten his Netherlandish roots, nor his Netherlandish client. His ability to depict different textures and the sheen of various textiles, look at Delilah's dress, for instance, or the carpet, reminds us of earlier Netherlandish paintings and the fact that much of Antwerp wealth in the 17th century still came from the textile trade. Rubens painted this on wood, a support considered old-fashioned in Italy by this time, as we know, but still frequently used in the northern and southern Netherlands. The great salon uh, in Rocox's house contained many paintings, but this one, I think, would have drawn the most attention when placed over the fireplace because of its drama. The painter clearly took into account this location. In the daytime, natural light falling on the scene would match what we see within the painting, while at night, the candlelight in the painting would resonate with actual candlelight in the room. 
The painting was a very expensive one when the National Gallery bought it in 1980. And not much later, controversy arose when uh, several scholars, none of them Rubens specialists, I have to add, insisted it was a fake or at least a copy of a lost original. Why did they believe this? Their arguments were largely based on differences from a reproductive uh, engraving made after the painting. But these arguments have really not convinced those who have most studied Rubens' early career. And I will go on record as saying this is not just a Rubens, but a terrific Rubens. It's frank eroticism, a common element in the paintings of the nevertheless pious Catholic artists, and powerful drama of light and shade, male and female, are really striking elements here. Rubens was an artist who could paint any subject, but he preferred some to others. Portraiture was one subject he was less drawn to, except for his most important clients and people close to him as friends and family members. A great example of this latter kind of portrait is the portrait of Susanna London from about 1622 to 1625. This painting entered the collection of the National Gallery in 1871 when the gallery bought the entire collection of a former prime minister, Sir Robert Peel. The 77 paintings in it were primarily by Dutch and Flemish painters, and this purchase helped to balance out what had been a much more strongly Italian orientation in the museum's collection. Now, we don't have any documentation for this painting that conclusively proves the identity of the sitter. However, Comparisons with other portraits suggest that this enchanting young woman may very well be Susanna London. She was the daughter of a luxury textile merchant, Daniel Formal, who was a friend of Rubens. She married Arnold London in 1622, and it is possible that the painting was done at the time of their marriage. Here she stands with hands modestly crossed at her waist, which only helps to draw attention to her very beautiful, lit and semi-bare bosom. And she is dressed in sumptuous clothes, befitting her status as a daughter of wealth through textiles. Her large eyes are focused on something over to her left, increasing the demure impression because she looks out of the picture but not quite at us. She also wears an extraordinary black hat decorated with feathers. In the 18th century, this painting was known as Le Chapeau de Paille, or the Straw Hat, but this was a misnomer. Clearly, this is no straw hat. However, an archaic French word for felt, poil, may have been confused at some point for pie or straw. In this portrait, the hat provides subtle shading for the face, suggesting the delicacy of the rose and white coloring of the sitter. Rubens often made changes to those paintings of a more personal nature while he was working on them. Here he added a strip of wood at the right and along the bottom, giving the figure more breathing room and contrasting the brighter left side with the shadier right side. By the mid-1620s, his painting style had moved from the more strongly sculptural look of about 1610 to figures now characterized by softened contours and a blending of brushwork. Depictions of women in Rubens' art often look considerably alike, even when a specific person was being portrayed. The small pointed features, large eyes, and rosy white skin reflect Rubens' female aesthetic. But it must have been delightful to him when a sitter already presented some of these characteristics in real life. Through a wonderful irony of fate, Rubens would end up marrying the younger sister of Susanna, Helena Formal, in the next decade, after the death of his beloved first wife, Isabella Brandt. Rubens was best known and most admired as a history painter. We've already seen an example of his religious art, so it is appropriate to turn to one of his political allegories. Minerva protects Pax from Mars from about 1629-30, not only shows us Rubens's creative erudition, but his heartfelt desire for peace in Europe, something that was eluding this period. At the left center of the painting, a semi-nude woman sits, holding one breast to nurse a small child. She is Pax, or Peace, in the guise of Ceres, goddess of the Earth's fertility. And the child is Plutus, god of wealth. Behind them and to the right, the armored warrior goddess Minerva pushes Mars, the god of war, away from the central group. In front of him, the fury Electo also prepares to leave the scene. To the left 
two more semi-nude women enter. One holds a tambourine, sign of a follower of Bacchus, while the other carries an elaborate gold bowl, symbol of the arts. A satyr kneels in front of Pax and, helped by a pudo, lifts fruit from a cornucopia to give to two young girls who are dressed in 17th century clothing. A leopard rolls playfully on the ground, batting at the fruit. Meanwhile, another young god, Hymen, god of marriage, crowns the older of the two girls, and another youth embraces them both. What does all of this mean? Peace and war are opposed, and only peace brings various kinds of prosperity, of the arts, the fruitfulness of the earth, and the fertility of marriage. Peace must be diligently protected, and war must be constantly fought off. Such allegories were Rubens's stock in trade, but no painter was more successful in bringing them to life. The gorgeous full nudes, beautifully depicted fruit and textiles, and the thrilling threat of Mars and Electo all contribute to the success of this image. Rubens was also a brilliant animal painter when he wished to be. It was painted on canvas, a support uh, more readily available in England for him than a large panel. It is possible that Rubens started with a smaller composition in mind that would feature the children, Pax, and the satyr. For the support here is made up of seven different pieces of canvas with two large pieces containing most of the central composition. This painting was made with a specific owner in mind and was likely initiated by Rubens himself. One of Rubens' most important diplomatic missions came at the end of the 1620s when he resided first at the Spanish court then at the English court, trying to promote a peace treaty between the two countries that were often hostile to each other in the 16th and 17th centuries. The recipient of the painting was none other than Charles I, King of England. Here, Rubens used painting itself to promote his cause. Charles was a passionate collector of art, and this painting could compete with the best in his collection. The two little girls were, it appears, the daughters of Balthazar Gerbier, a Dutchman who worked at the English court as a painter and diplomat. Rubens stayed with Gerbier while in England and painted a portrait of Gerbier's wife and children, which is now in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. This is a beautiful and sumptuous painting and reflects in style Rubens's recent study of Titian at the Spanish court. His style continued to open up and soften in response to Titian's manner. It is also a heartfelt painting. No one was more committed to peace than Rubens, for his country was still embroiled in the Eighty Years' War in the 1620s and 30s. It would not end until 1648, eight years after Rubens' death. Rubens is perhaps best known today for paintings with large, fleshy female nudes, not always to modern taste. But a painting like The Judgment of Paris from about 1632 to 35 might convince some to think differently, at least about his abilities. This was a subject from classical mythology that was dearly loved by Rubens, who painted it many times in his career. An earlier version from about 1600 also hangs in the National Gallery, and it is fascinating to make a comparison between one painting and the other painted decades later. Rubens probably used the ancient Greek writer Lucian as his specific source for the story that was actually told in various accounts. The episode was one of a series of events that led to the Trojan War. Three goddesses, Minerva, Juno, and Venus, all wished to vie for the golden apple inscribed to the fairest that had been thrown out the wedding, uh, at the wedding of Peleus and Thetis by Eris, goddess of strife. Jupiter decided he didn't want to judge this contest, so he told the god Mercury to take the three goddesses and the prince shepherd Paris to Mount Ida, where pa Paris can make his decision. In Lucian's semi-comic version of the story, the goddesses disrobe and each promises Paris a reward if she is chosen. Venus offers him the most beautiful mortal woman. Love carries the day, Venus wins, Paris will eventually mate with Helen of Troy, who was unfortunately already married, and thus will the Trojan War commence. The painting in its present condition shows the goddesses largely disrobed, and Paris has already made his decision. He and Venus look towards each other, and he holds out the apple in her direction, while Mercury stands behind him. We recognize the goddesses here by their traditional symbols. Minerva, at far left, is shown with her owl, 
armor and shield with the head of Medusa, while Juno, at the right in the group, is accompanied by her peacock, which here hisses at Paris's dog. Cupid, at far left, plays with Venus's clothing and serves as an attribute of his mother. Despite the lighthearted subject and lush presentation, the darker impact of the story is made clear by the presence of the Fury Electo in the sky, whom we know Rubens associated with war. So this is a prefiguration of what will happen after this. Venus may have been inspired here by Helena Formal, Rubens' second wife, whom he married in 1630 after his trip to Spain and England. She was 16, he was 53. It was reported back to Philip IV of Spain that Rubens had married the most beautiful woman in Antwerp. Again, we're in a new era where kings gossip about artists. There are several versions of this subject from the 1630s from Rubens' studio. One now in the painting gallery in Dresden, attributed primarily to his workshop, comes closest in composition to the National Gallery's painting. Recent study of the London version with infrared reflectography and paint analysis by scientists at the National Gallery was published in 2005 and points to major changes in the composition carried out at two distinct times. Bear with me while I go into a little detail here. Originally, Pudi helped the goddesses to disrobe, doves fluttered around Venus's head, while a Puto flew above her, and Paris stuck his left leg out and wore a shirt with rolled up sleeves. He held the apple near his lap while Mercury gestured to the goddesses to proceed with their unveiling. Satyrs spied on the scene from the upper branches of the tree at left. The Dresden version was designed to reflect this stage of painting, but before the London version was even varnished, Rubens had taken out the putti, helping the goddesses disrobe and change the position of Minerva's left arm. However, the significant changes to the poses of Mercury in Paris and the elimination of the satyrs appears to have been done later, even after Rubens' lifetime, as analysis of the paint layers and varnish indicate. Study of the provenance of the National Gallery painting supports the idea that it was purchased by the Duc de Richelieu, the great nephew of the Cardinal we saw in Lecture 13, in late 1675 or 1676. The painting was written about in 1676 by the art theorist and advisor to Richelieu, Roger de Pio, who clearly described the painting as it must have left Rubens' studio before the changes to Paris, Mercury, and the Satyrs. Why the further changes? The Rubens scholar Fiona Healy has connected the painting's alteration to the battle of the so-called Poussinis and Rubenists in the late 17th century in France. The Poussinis champion Poussin's narrative and compositional decorum is the best model, while the Rubenis promoted Rubens's rich color and pictorial beauty. De Peel, a Rubenis, had encouraged Richelieu to build up a collection of Flemish and Dutch paintings, which the Poussinis loathed. A Poussinis then publicly attacked the Rubens paintings owned by Richelieu and described him as a gullible collector. By the end of 1676, it appears that Richelieu had already sold the judgment of Paris. The Poussinis critique would center on the undignified figure of Paris, the gawking satyrs, and the choice of a seemingly anecdotal moment rather than the climactic one. Of course, Rubens' composition had been closer to the ironic spirit of Lucian's text, but this was not the concern of the late 17th century critics. Pictorial propriety won the day, and at some point, between 1676 and 1727, when the painting was next described when in the Duc d'Orléans collection, it had attained its present state. The Poussinis had won the day, at least in the battle over this painting. A painting can live a precarious existence, and even the wishes of the master who painted it are not sacrosanct. One last painting by Rubens shows a side of his art that seems to have been a private one, his landscape paintings. He made landscapes throughout his career, but the evidence of contemporary inventories is that they were not for public sale. Five of the Rubens paintings in the National Gallery are landscapes, and we will look at the latest and most personal, a view of Etstein in the early morning from about 1636. Rubens bought this country estate in 1635 and became Lord of Etstein. In those last years before his death in 1640, he spent an increasing amount of time away from Antwerp and at this country house. 
The house we see at the left middle ground, while in the foreground, a hunter and his dog stalk game and a peasant's cart rides by. The landscape lush with grass, trees, and water sweeps into the distance where a townscape appears and the sky is lit with bright yellow clouds. It is a vision of harmony between different social classes. Note, for instance, the wealthier figures that stand near the house. Between cultivation and untamed nature, an example of peace and fruitfulness. The Netherlandish tradition of the independent landscape is used here by Rubens to create an allegory of his own happiness in his later life, but also a desire to see his native land prosper once again. It is an autumn scene, we know that, by the plants of the season, just as it was the autumn of Rubens' life. But in both cases, this was a season of richness, not melancholy. Death is present, there is a dead deer on the peasant's cart, and the hunter is stalking the unaware partridges. But that is part of the larger pattern of life to be faced philosophically by the learned artist. By this point, Rubens was a wealthy man, but he was always frugal. The painting is on panel, but the support is actually comprised of 17 separate pieces fitted together, likely from leftover wooden strips in his workshop. His concept of the landscape seemed to grow during the painting process itself, as that happened with the painting of Susanna London, and strips were added to accommodate this expansive vision. The painting entered the National Gallery in 1826, just after, uh, two years after its founding, as part of Sir George Beaumont's bequest of 15 paintings from his private collection. Beaumont was an amateur landscape painter and a member of the Royal Academy who collected old master paintings. He played a crucial role in the government's founding of the National Gallery, promising a bequest from his own collection if they purchased the Angerstein collection. The second most famous Flemish painter of the 17th century, Sir Anthony van Dyck, is also well represented in the National Gallery with 16 paintings largely on display in one room. Most are portraits and date from the periods when he worked in England. Van Dyck, whose dates were 1599 to 1641, was a generation younger than Rubens and followed in his footsteps. He was an Antwerp native and worked there before going to Italy in the 1620s. He then returned to Antwerp, but from 1632 on, he was based in London, where he became principal painter to Charles I and was quickly knighted by him. In 1640, he returned for a time to Antwerp after the death of Rubens, perhaps thinking to relocate and dominate the artistic scene there. However, he became ill and died prematurely in 1641. In England, Van Dyck specialized in aristocratic portraiture and would set the standard for this for two centuries to come. The only figure with comparable impact had been Holbein in the previous century. Van Dyck was far and away Charles I's favorite portrait painter. One a category of portraiture at which Van Dyck excelled was the equestrian portrait, for he reinvented this type with every painting he made. The National Gallery's equestrian portrait of Charles I from about 1637 to 38 glorifies Charles as both powerful ruler and chivalric knight. The iconography of the ruler on horseback goes back to Roman statues of the emperors. The metaphor is that the proper ruler can control and run his kingdom as a skilled rider controls his horse. An advantage of equestrian portraiture for Charles I was that it helped to increase his physical stature. He only stood about 5 feet 4 inches tall. In this portrait, he rides out in a beautiful landscape, dressed in armor and holding the baton of office, but bareheaded. A page holds his helmet at the far right. Sitting erect, he exudes a confident power. He wears the Lesser George around his neck, a medallion that symbolizes his role as the head of the most noble order of the Garter. This chivalric order was founded by the Crown in the mid-14th century, with membership limited to the King, the Prince of Wales, and 24 other knights chosen by the King. The plaque hanging on the tree behind him reads in Latin, Charles, King of Great Britain. He was only the second King of United Scotland and England after his father, James I. This painting likely hung in the Prince's Gallery in the Royal Palace at Hampton Court. Charles I was an accidental king. As a second son who was never expected to take the throne until his older brother Henry, Prince of Wales, died at the age of 18 when Charles was 12. 
ill-suited to the role of king, he nevertheless believed passionately in the divine sanction of earthly rule by anointed kings. Van Dyke wanted to convey Charles's sense of personal authority while also suggesting something of the elegant and introspective man that Charles was personally. Thus, the head is a sensitive study of this ill-fated monarch. No two of the tree branches that arch over the head of Charles like a cloth of honor. It all seems effortless here on the part of both the patron and the painter. A painting of two young relatives of Charles I also encapsulates what must be called Van Dyck's genius at reinventing or creating portrait types. Lords John and Bernard Stewart, painted about 1638, suggests the origin of the type of the languid, self-confident British aristocrat. And this kind of painting would be done for at least two centuries after Van Dyck. John Stewart at left and his one-year younger brother Bernard at right were the two youngest children of 11 born to Esme Stewart, the third Duke of Lennox. In 1639, they left England to make a grand tour of Europe. This portrait likely dates from right before they left both still teenagers. The scale of this full-length portrait is impressive, but so is Van Dyck's ability to suggest subtle differences in personality. The older brother appears here more restrained and thoughtful, the younger one who looks right at the viewer more assertive. All of this is conveyed by their poses, their facial expression, and even costume. But do these characterizations tell the truth? A contemporary source indicates that Lord John was brasher than his younger brother, while Bernard was sweet in temperament. In other words, Van Dyck may have characterized them in a certain way. That doesn't mean it really followed the truth of who they were. A chalk drawing for the costume in the pose of Lord Bernard Stewart is preserved in the British Museum. Typically, an aristocratic patron would spend only limited time posing for a portrait and primarily to get the head right. Servants were often then sent to substitute for them for detailed costume studies when necessary. A note of poignancy accompanies our viewing of this image when we realize that both young men would live only until the age of 23. Born a year apart, they died a year apart as well, fighting as royalists on the side of the king, their steward cousin, in the English Civil War. And it may have been the growing clouds of war, even in 1640, that uh, encouraged uh, Van Dyck to leave England and go back to Antwerp at this point. Though he had clients uh, that would end up on both sides of the conflict, of the uh, ones uh, fighting against the king as well as those for, fighting for him. Rubens' visit to Spain was influential for him through his renewed acquaintance with Titian's painting style, through the famous collections of Philip IV. In turn, Rubens would provide an influential example for the Spanish painter Velazquez, whose talents Rubens recognized. Thus, this would be a good moment to turn to Spain in its golden age. 